Okay, so let me go ahead and kick things off. So I'm really excited about, about today's symposium. Um, it's gonna be by Kelly Pierce at the Texas Advanced Computing Center or TAC, HPC for Epidemic Modeling with Limited Data, COVID-19 Case Studies. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Kelly. Let me just stop sharing my screen. And I spoke with Kelly before um, before the symposium got started, and she said that she is happy to take questions as we go along. So please let me ask you to enter those into the chat box, and I will interrupt Kelly and field them for you. So Kelly, with that, go ahead, share your screen, and you can get started whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today to listen to this talk. As Bob said, uh, please interrupt with questions if you have them. Uh, I was just telling Bob before we got started that this is my first time giving this talk, and so uh, I will be very um, curious to hear what you think needs additional clarification or if you have any questions as we go along. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep, I am, sound good. I am this perfect. Um, and I am just organizing my windows. Great. So my name is Kelly Pierce. Uh, I'm a research associate in the Scalable Computational Intelligence Group at TAC. And I've been a member of ECSS for, uh, I think, since the beginning of 2020. So just in time to um, hop on board and help with some of the COVID related work uh, that's happening uh, in collaboration with TAC. And so today I'm going to be talking specifically about some of the challenges surrounding uh, modeling COVID-19 transmission in uh, a world with rather limited data. So advancing slides, this worked when we tried it out. Um, okay, so uh, I've been working with the UT COVID-19 Modeling Consortium on a variety of situational awareness models for about the last year. And, and actually it is almost a year to the date uh, since, since I joined this group and since UT Austin uh, shut down and had people start working from home for, you know, just, just a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two. So it has uh, been a long journey for all of us, I know. And so this is sort of a look back to, to what happened really early on and how we tried to tackle those challenges before we knew all the details about how COVID-19 was transmitted and, and how to keep ourselves safe. And over the process of the last year, what that research has led to is a number of public facing dashboards. And you can find all of those at covid19.tac.utexas.edu as the TAC team has done a really nice job of beautifully displaying the work of the COVID consortium uh, in, a, in a manner that makes it easy for the, the public to look at and uh, sort of see how, how the disease is unfolding uh, in central Texas and also in other parts of the country. So this first screenshot that I'm showing you is of a hospitalization projections dashboard for the state of Texas. There's also a dashboard projecting mortality across uh, the states of across all 50 states in the US. There's an additional dashboard uh, that tries to estimate the number of introductions you would expect if you had schools open at a given classroom or pod size to give parents and educators some, some sense of the risk that they take by uh, have, engaging in in-person education. And also a dashboard that uh, helps guide genomic surveillance, posing the question, how many positive COVID samples would you need to sequence in order to detect the novel variants that I know are, are on everyone's mind as we think about how uh, you know, the next months and years go in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is sort of the, I would say, final-ish product of a very long stretch of work. Uh, and I just want to lead with some of the conclusions that, that we have taken away from this. And hopefully over the course of the talk, I'll, I'll convince you that these conclusions are valid. But after one year of living in this pandemic and, and doing research on the spread of COVID-19, we've learned that small amounts of data can provide really crucial insights when they're used carefully. 
We've also learned that public health data collection, aggregation, and dissemination, uh, they, they've changed dramatically, they've needed to change dramatically, and they need more investment uh, to, to help deliver the type of data that informs the interventions and the preparedness that we need to tackle COVID-19 and similar crises should they arise. Hopefully not, but you never know. And finally, HPC and the teams at HPC centers uh, have, have been really helpful, at least I think, in, in supporting fast iteration and turnaround time on both research and production models. So we're trying to take some of the routine lift off of the researchers so that they can get back to the creative problem solving that, that they like to do and that advances, pushes science forward. So uh, with that, I wanna introduce the COVID consortium as a, a massive group of people that have all pitched in to help with this effort. Again, there's the, the URL if you'd like to visit the website and see the dashboards and see the list of publications. Uh, the COVID-19 Modeling Consortium is led by Lauren Ansel Myers. Uh, she is a professor of integrative biology at UT. Uh, Spencer Fox is the assistant director and Becky Kester is the project manager. And together, the three of them hurt, hurt a variety of cats, uh, postdocs and graduate students in the Myers lab, other researchers across the University of Texas at Austin and Dell Medical School. TAC has dedicated a number of, of their team members uh, and then there are external collaborators for um, uh, from a variety of institutions across the across the country and uh, across the world. And yeah, I've I've used since the slides have the TAC logo all over them. I wanted to share with you the TAC Taco logo, uh, sort of riffing on the fact that uh, at a distance the TAC acronym might look like the word taco. And uh, we're trying to add a little bit of fun and whimsy uh, in what is otherwise a heavy topic of conversation, which is the, the ongoing pandemic. So the TAC Taco. How official is the TAC Taco logo? Um, I don't I don't know, but we have, I, I found an image of it, so I'm using it. So um, let's start, or I guess move, move on to talk about modeling the first wave. And just to orient you in time, this is the time series, uh, a little bit pixelated, of COVID-19 hospitalizations in Austin, uh, the Austin Round Rock MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area in Central Texas. And we're looking at a time period from March of 2020, so late February, uh, up through a more or less present day. And uh, hospitalizations, oops, Sorry about that, hospitalizations on the y-axis. And so pretend that you are here. Uh, in Central Texas, this is about the time that lockdowns began. And I have lockdowns in quotes because I think we sort of all lived through this uncertainty of what, what does a lockdown mean? How was it enforced? Where can you go? But this is about the time that we began talking about these, these big changes in behavior to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 and to flatten the curve. It's also, uh, interestingly, right about the time that Netflix premiered Tiger King. So really just in time for many of us to, uh, to stay home in our pajamas for long stretches of time and, and binge Netflix. Not everyone certainly was so lucky, but um, take yourselves mentally back to a time when you couldn't find toilet paper, but you could watch Tiger King uh, as much as you wanted. So approaching this question of, of trying to model the first wave, I put together this schematic that is how I think of uh, the life cycle of a model. So uh, it's, it's a mess of text boxes and arrows, but if we start up here in sort of the upper left-hand corner, there's, uh, there's a cycle of defining a question and collecting data. And these two aspects, original, uh, they play off of each other. You define a question, if you're not a data producer, if you are a consumer of data, you go out into the world and then you try to find data that will help you address your question and you modify that question as necessary. Then you can move into selecting, implementing and analyzing a model, eventually critiquing attempting to validate it and communicating the results before you feed back into this iterative cycle of building on your model. And when I look at this image, I sometimes feel 
a little bit frantic. This is a complicated process. You grab data, select a model, implement the model. Wait, no, grab more data. And so what I'm trying to do is anchor this sort of frantic process, at least in this cartoon of of how the work should unfold. And I realize that this is work that a lot of you do routinely. Uh, you may not think of it in exactly this, this paradigm, uh, but I'm showing this not to belabor the point, but to give us sort of a, a timeline to anchor our conversation today. So in the first wave, the whole push was around uh, flattening the curve. And if you were anything like me at some point, it just became tiring to see flattening the curve, flattening the curve, flattening the curve. So I present to you catening the curve uh, to remind you of, uh, of what the goal was with a feline twist. So this was, was a tweet from, uh, from a scientist proposing to use cats to motivate curve flattening and uh, noting that data sets and graphs are not compelling to many people, but cats are. So in our um, alert, aggressive cat is ready to scratch you, whereas laying down cat uh, is probably not going to claw you and um, is a little bit calmer. And so we were trying to, to push that curve down, flatten that cat. And that was sort of the goal early on back in March of 2020 to try to understand how we might flatten the curve and really to ask, um, are we flat yet? How bad is this going to get? Uh, will we overwhelm hospital capacity uh, by having a surge in cases or will we be able to keep the healthcare demand low enough to not overwhelm our, our hospital capacity? And there were many groups that were asking the same question that shared the same goal. I'm not going to talk about their work. I will focus specifically on the work of UT's COVID-19 modeling consortium, but I do wanna point out that this work didn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington had a lot of uh, communication about projections. The Imperial College of London had a COVID-19 response team also modeling uh, healthcare demand projections. Johns Hopkins continues to put forth data about situational awareness. Los Alamos National Laboratory has uh, modeling efforts. And this is just a sample of really a large number of, of research teams working to, to answer this question of how bad will it get? Have we flattened the curve? What could we do if we, if we haven't gotten there yet? So that's the question and the players. And I want to talk a little bit about the data at this stage. We have a sense of rate parameters. So from clinical literature, studies of the Diamond Princess cruise, the outbreaks in Lombardy, Italy, we had some sense of the time course of infection. What is the rate at which people get infected? What is the rate at which uh, they become hospitalized? if they have severe COVID, the rate at which people recover, the mortality rate, all of these bits of data from the literature come together to inform our understanding of transmission. We also have data on age structured contact patterns drawn from journal studies and informed by local demographics like the age structure of the area that you are trying to model. And we also had some understanding of risk at this stage, uh, risk of severe outcome or mortality due to COVID-19 based on data on comorbidities like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, or other conditions that exacerbated the severity of COVID infection. So wrapping up this stage of our model life cycle, the framework that we, we want to use to uh, address the question with the data at hand is a compartmental disease transmission model. And if you're not familiar with com compartmental disease transmission models, this is a schematic of sort of a cartoon of what a simple model would look like. Uh, you think of your population as being broken down into what are called compartments, subsets, uh, based on their state with respect to the disease. And you build a system of equations to track the population in each compartment through time. So in a simple 
framework, you have a susceptible compartment. These are people who could become infected with your disease of interest, but aren't yet. For a disease like COVID-19, where there is a latent period between uh, that infection and becoming infectious, uh, subtle but important distinction, there is an exposed compartment. Then when people become capable of transmitting the infection to others, they're, they are moved into the infectious compartment. And then uh, after the conclusion of infection, these people are recovered, sometimes called removed. Uh, this can also include death, uh, essentially removal from the system, either by recovery with immunity or through mortality. And I, I'm trying, even though I know that this is a, a technical audience, math is hard to look at in slides, and so I'm trying to keep it to a minimum, but I do want to draw your attention to uh, this uh, particular equation. It's one of the simplest forms of tracking the rate at which people leave the susceptible compartment for the exposed compartment. And this is the product of the number of susceptible individuals and the number of infected individuals multiplied by the per capita per contact probability of transmission when an infected individual encounters a susceptible individual. And in some formulations, this is uh, divided by the total population in the system. And I bring this up because this parameter beta, this per capita per contact probability of transmission is one of the important parameters that we uh, try to, uh, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about this parameter in the context of COVID-19 and other diseases. So putting together these three pieces, question, data, and model, really um, starting to look like that. It's always sunny in Philadelphia, red lines everywhere, uh, GIF, GIF, where we've got this, um, this complicated compartmental model with, uh, for COVID, it's much, there are many more compartments accounting for pre-symptomatic individuals, asymptomatic individuals, uh, but we can sort of break it down into, this is the stage that uh, the transition that relates to transmission of the disease. These are the compartments that relate to latency to infectiousness. These are the compartments that relate to transition to the recovered, whoop, to the recovered compartment. And then some fraction of symptomatic people become hospitalized and of those hospitalized people, some may pass away and some may recover. So here's our model. Our data, again, just to recap, includes some fixed rate parameters, latency, transmission, and mortality or recover. We have some contact patterns, uh, how the age how contacts are age structured in different environments, and we have some local demography and risk from comorbidities. So this is our, our early March 2020 landscape of data and model to do COVID projections. And here is an example of one of those projections from March 26th, 2020, presented to the city of Austin, I think shared in the media a little bit, showing what hospitalizations might look like under different levels of interventions. So these are all model results here. There's no empirical data on hospitalizations in this figure, but we see time from March 26th forward into August and curves for no social distancing, no behavioral intervention. Another curve that's in uh, sort of uh, pale blue gray what might happen if we close schools and we remove some of the contacts in younger people? Uh, what might happen if we uh, manage to reduce 50% of disease transmitting contacts? What might happen if we reduce 75%? And what might happen if we reduce 90% of disease transmitting uh, contacts? So this is a less whimsical version of flattening the curve that doesn't have caps on it, but you know, this is the that standard image that you've probably seen hundreds of times, but uh, with a little bit more of a, a local Austin flavor because it's using the demographics of the city of Austin. And so we're now here at this stage where we're analyzing our results, critiquing and validating them and finding ways to communicate them to the community. What we, oh, and just to, um, to emphasize this point, when 
when we talk about percent reduction in this figure, we're talking about a percent reduction in this per capita per contact probability of transmission. So we are taking this beta term in our model and we are making it smaller. And we're exploring what happens when we, when we dampen that parameter down. And one of the first critiques that we could make of this model, and remember this is March of 2020, well, there's still a lot we didn't know at this stage, but behavior impacts transmission probability. And you may have seen this meme online about uh, the impact of wearing pants on getting wet if someone attempts to urinate on you. Um, and just catching a question in the, in the chat, no social distancing does, the, so the question is, does social, does no social distancing mean no prevention steps, including masks? And that is correct. Um, so at this point in time, we were calling it social distancing because that's sort of what everybody was calling it at this point in time. Uh, over time, our, our nomenclature and how we refer to this evolved, but this is essentially no multiplier on that beta term. So the model's really agnostic to, um, are you staying six feet apart? Are you wearing masks? Are you in a bubble? Uh, do you never leave your house? It it's, doesn't posit how transmission is reduced. It just says it has somehow magically been reduced and whatever combination of factors you could use to get transmission down to that level, this is what you would expect if you were successful. So um, returning to this meme, uh, we can reason that there are some behaviors that would uh, lead to high transmission of infection. So uh, the, the meme is that uh, if nobody is wearing pants and somebody tries to pee on somebody else, then the other person gets wet. Uh, so that sort of correlates to our, our high transmission scenario. If one person is wearing pants, but the other person isn't, uh, you know, that person might get a little bit wet. Maybe that's medium transmission. And if everybody is wearing pants, really the only, the only person who gets wet is the one urinating. And this has been used as sort of a, a humorous, if, if a bit um, um, crass way of, of trying to convince people to wear masks. And uh, switching over to the actual um, mask intervention itself, uh, we've observed that behavioral norms and intervention policies have evolved over time. So uh, early in the pandemic, there was little usage of masks. There's a combination of uh, stress to not wear masks to pres preserve them for healthcare workers. Uh, and, and it just really wasn't the social or behavioral norm at the time. And as the pandemic moved forward, as time moved forward, the prevalence of mask wearing increased. And so uh, optimistically this, and it did bear out uh, that this lowered transmission. And so these behaviors are, and the prevalence of engaging in those behaviors are associated with lowering uh, the, the transmission rate. Okay. And so this, yeah, Kelly, yes. before we go on, um, we have one, one question in the chat, actually two now. Uh, so the first is from, from Madhu Lodro. Did you attempt logistic model? Um, the model that underlies this, and I'll, I'll talk more. We're, so I think to answer your question, we're not attempting to fit the curve using a purely statistical model. We are attempting to parameterize the process model in such a way that it reproduces the observed patterns in infection and hospitalization. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, um, but the, I think the, the short answer to that question is there is not a, there's not a logistic, did you become infected? did you not become infected binary process that's in this. Uh, there is uh, in some formulations of it, a Poisson process that uh, sort of behaves similarly, but I, I hope that answers the question. And, and if it doesn't, please, um, please follow up in chat and I'll, I'll try to do a better job. And then the second question I'm seeing is, um, where does mask behavior data come from? Those data don't, um, they don't exist, and um, that, and that's a that's a good question because I don't mean to present this slide as um, 
it's more of an anecdote. Uh, what I have observed uh, being out in the community to the limited extent that I am is that people have started wearing more masks. And so um, what we are assuming is that any, any behavior that reduces trans, let me think of the best way to phrase this. Um, we don't have direct mask behavior data and therefore it's not linked directly to the change in beta because it, it doesn't exist, but we're making an assumption that as people wear masks more frequently or generally do um, additional modifications to their behavior, that that's going to cause uh, a change in the transmission rate. And uh, I'll get a little bit more into the details of how we're trying to estimate beta further on in the talk, because I realize that that's an, an unsatisfying answer to say, oh, it's just an assumption. But as of March, April, 2020, it was just an assumption. Um, and as we work through the process, we have some more data that we can add in, not directly about masks to help uh, reinforce that, that assertion. So we're moving into uh, early April of 2020, and uh, we're realizing that uh, this model is nice, but we we need to include we need to include some assessment of variable transmission because whether it's masking or staying far apart or staying at home or not being in schools, we are hoping that there is a behavioral change that will reduce transmission. And so. We then moved toward trying to estimate the transmission probability beta directly from data by asking uh, what value of beta would produce the observed hospitalizations. And hopefully this is getting to that question of how beta is linked in any way to the real world. And we use least squares regression uh, as a starting point for estimating this parameter beta from hospitalization data. And so, to give you a landscape of the available data that we could use to answer this question, um, how many infections do we expect? How many hospitalizations do we expect? How many deaths do we expect? Uh, we have some potential data streams that map onto this. We ultimately used hospitalization data, and I'm going to try to put together the case for that for you now. Uh, as, as you might recall from a year ago, it was hard to get a COVID test. So when we ask how many infections we might expect, uh, we could look at how many cases have been reported, but we have to ask uh, if suspected cases are being tested or not. Are there enough tests around to, to actually assess all the suspected cases? And are there biases in testing policies that would make it difficult for us to make reasonable inference from reported case data. And we ultimately decided, as did many other modeling groups, that reported case data were really insufficient to uh, try to infer transmission probabilities. We could ask uh, how many patients have been hospitalized with COVID-19 to, um, to really hone in on that expectation of hospitalizations. And this is, is ultimately what we did. Uh, we could also ask how many deaths have been attributed to COVID-19. And uh, this is a really robust signal. Uh, if you are reported, if a person is reported of having died from COVID-19, there's a pretty solid chance that that is an accurate cause of death. There are some deaths that are missed due to um, maybe recording of comorbid conditions, um, deaths that occur outside of the hospital. Uh, but the biggest problem that we have using mortality data is that it's really lagged. It, uh, it takes a while between when a person gets infection and infected to when they die. And so we, along with many other modeling groups, honed in on, on hospitalization data. And that allowed us to estimate, estimate stepwise transmission probabilities. Uh, we have a baseline transmission probability that we can estimate for a time period where we have known hospital census data, otherwise referred to as, as heads and beds, how many beds are occupied in a hospital, and uh, no intervention policies. So left unmitigated, what's the transmission probability of COVID-19? And then we can further estimate uh, the transmission reduction for subsequent time periods using, again, known hospital census data 
and the knowledge that there was some constant ish intervention policy that would allow us to assume a stepwise change in beta. Uh, and I have these slides, maybe not in the best order, uh, but just following up on, on the case for using hospitalization data as a relatively new metric in pandemic surveillance. Um, it's pretty reliable. You expect that only true COVID-19 cases are reported, but it's a little bit lagged. It takes a while between infection and hospitalization, not as long as death. Uh, it is incomplete. Not all cases result in hospitalization. Uh, not all cases produce severe infection, but it is actionable uh, in the sense that we can get it early enough to, to gain insights. And um, there's no standardized reporting infrastructure for hospitalizations. That's really the crux of the problem is that uh, public health surveillance usually deals in suspected, probable, and confirmed cases and not so much in hospitalizations. So this is a big change for our public health infrastructure to start aggregating and reporting out these data. And again, we're using this as a proxy for severe uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we're updating our uh, already very complex schematic with some additional data. Um, we need some knowledge about variable transmission, and we're going to make assumptions about that due to the onset of policy-based interventions. And we also need hospital census data to do our parameter estimation. And this is the slide I was hoping to show you uh, right after I discussed uh, stepwise transmission probability, but we are assuming uh, flat, constant transmission probabilities across windows of time. So I'm returning to this image of COVID-19 hospitalizations as a function of time in Austin in the early epidemic, in the early pandemic, where there would be some uh, baseline transmission rate uh, beta. Uh, and these, this line should be higher than the other line. Uh, but essentially, there's, there's a big shift uh, to another scalar beta value, uh, where beta is multiplied by some percentage transmission reduction. And you could potentially carry out that new value to project future cases if your assumption that uh, beta is fixed for a long window of time holds. And in April 20th of 2020, we were able to make some healthcare demand projections for three different cities in Texas based on this stepwise beta fitting. And so I'm showing you three panels here uh, from early March to mid-May. The top panel, or the, the y-axis is reported hospitalizations and the top panel shows hospitalizations for Austin, middle is Houston, Texas, and the bottom is Beaumont, Texas, which is down on the border between Texas and Louisiana. And the gray shading indicates what we infer from news reports and press releases to be the pre-intervention period, the period where uh, COVID was spreading in these communities without any explicit policy-based request to socially distance or shut down businesses. The filled black points in this image are reported hospitalizations that were included in the parameter estimation estimation uh, that we reported to the cities back in April. And the empty circles are hospital census data that were not included in the report, data that we were able to, uh, to layer into this after the fact to see how well our projections did. The red lines are the median projections and the uh, pink shading and the 95% prediction intervals on our estimates. So we estimate our transmission rate. We then uh, do a number of stochastic simulations where uh, there is variation in the uh, transition probabilities. And this is where that Poisson process comes in. The, the probability that somebody moves between compartments is, is drawn from a Poisson distribution. And uh, that's part of what injects the stochasticity into this model. So lengthy orientation to, uh, to those figures. But what we see is that uh, our, some of our predictions did well. Some of them didn't do well. Uh, but most importantly, I want to draw your attention to 
these areas of the curve for Houston and Beaumont, where we actually didn't have any data on hospital census from the pre-intervention period. So this is ideally what we would use to learn the baseline transmission rate. And we might reasonably assume that it's different for the different cities because of their different demographies, um, their different workplaces and commuting patterns and whether or not there's public transportation, all those different aspects of a city that define how people interact with each other, not necessarily the same across these localities, but because hospital census data is not something that public health entities normally report or aggregate or disseminate, these are data that simply were not available and will never become available unless someone has the time and inclination to sift through a lot of electronic health records. And it was pretty quickly actually that, uh, that these, these municipalities, these metropolitan areas were able to start reporting hospitalization data, but it still came after the intervention period. And so what this required us to do then was to borrow our estimate for Austin and uh, use the um, and use that baseline transmission for all of the cities, all through the other two cities. And so Kenneth asks in chat that he would like to see the Austin confidence interval at Houston scaling. Um, it goes way up. Uh, and there's, if we have time at the end, I can talk more about why that is. We see the prediction intervals a little bit narrower for the other uh, two cities because we tweaked a little bit how we were calculating it. But that is a great observation. These are wide prediction intervals. There is a lot of uncertainty in these models, which is something that the consortium has improved on uh, over the past year. But that yeah, is a, is a great observation. So, um, and this is uh, a table that just, it comes out of the paper where we, we published the previous figure. Um, just putting together these three reports, um, one for Austin, one for Houston, and one for Beaumont, required uh, something like 6,300 runs of this model. And we were able to iterate on that really quickly because we were using HPC and because we were able to transfer some of the development and optimization load over to TAC. So the COVID-19 modeling consortium put together this model and they were able to handle hand it off so that we could get it running uh, fast and not quite turnkey, but um, fast, fast enough to iterate quickly. And so um, I think over the, um, I think each, each one of the model sets that we ran took about two hours to run. And I can't convert in my head, uh, single core, single node wall clock times total to the number of um, wall clock hours, but it, it's not a crazy long run time, but it did help to be able to move through this quickly. So stepwise, um, stepwise estimation of our transmission probability has some problems. Um, so now we are at the stage where we are um, back into that analyzing and critiquing our results. So we know that the confidence intervals are really wide. Um, that's a problem. But also the framework that we're using of assuming that transmission probabilities are constant through time is uh, an assumption that we didn't really feel comfortable with. Uh, so I'm showing you here. Um, an image that I made when I was troubleshooting trying to add a third beta into this step function for estimation. And things just got too complicated that this assumption that you have these windows of time where transmission probability is constant and then it jumps, it just doesn't hold. And the Texas Tribune put together a nice uh, timeline of major events with respect to coronavirus in Texas uh, as of the end of July. March 6th, Austin canceled the South by Southwest Music Festival. March 13th, uh, Governor Greg Abbott declared a statewide emergency. March 31st, we were all asked to stay home and schools were closed. Uh, in April, early April, the CDC started to recommend masking. And then in May, some businesses started to reopen. Actually, uh, as of uh, last Wednesday, 
Texas is open for business again. So there were a lot of changes and a lot of variable messaging around what we should be doing to change transmission and to flatten the curve. And that meant we needed a more flexible framework for making these inferences about transmission probability. And so this is where the consortium started to pursue cell phone mobility data as a proxy for behavior, something that's more direct than uh, looking at a timeline of policy press releases and making a step function. Uh, it doesn't directly get at the behavior that we're interested in, but it is closer. And so we have a slightly different variation of our model uh, that links mobility data from cell phones into this beta parameter in a statistical framework. And so showing you some SafeGraph mobility data from Houston, SafeGraph is the company that, um, that spies on people through their cell phones more or less uh, and typically sells these data to advertisers, but they've made this data available freely for public use to help with COVID intervention. You may have heard about cell phone mobility data uh, for, for use in uh, in COVID modeling before. And what I'm showing you here is a time series of seven, uh, eight different panels, uh, each one showing a normalized score for mobility from uh, see, mid to late February to uh, maybe about the end of May, or sorry, mid-May. And uh, this panel is mobility related to colleges as points of interest. Uh, this panel is mobility related to drinking or bars. Uh, grocery stores here. Uh, so you see all these um, dropping off precipitously. There are far fewer devices that are ending up at colleges, bars, grocery stores. Um, this is museums and parks in blue. This teal green is medical locations. This is schools. Schools closed um, in late March. Uh, restaurants. Uh, closed and then slowly started to open back up. And you see uh, this panel here is really telling uh, its home dwelling time. And it shows uh, that people started staying home a lot uh, in, in April and late March. So these data were layered in uh, and they were incorporated specifically using a partially observed Markov process. So I borrowed this image from a nice uh, a nice intro to partially observed Markov processes put together by Aaron King. Uh, it's an, an epidemiologist and ecologist. And so the, the concept here is that we have a, a state process, like, are you infected with the disease? And we have some measurement process like testing that uh, tries to make assertions, or it doesn't try to make assertions, but it tries to understand that state process. And that measurement process results in data. And so uh, for, for our scenario, that state process again is this disease model. Uh, the measurement process is COVID testing and hospitalization. And the data are a time series of hospital census, um, hospital occupancy counts. And then we can also add into that measurement process data on where these, these devices are. And, uh, Oh, we can add into that measurement process uh, the cell phone tracking that produces this data on uh, where people are spending their time. And so uh, that using partially uh, observed Markov processes, which can also describe these processes through time and give us temporal variation in uh, estimated parameters when they're coupled with regression models. Uh, we, we added that in and we also updated how we uh, how we utilized hospitalization data. So we primarily used hospital census data uh, early on. And uh, what a couple of statisticians who worked with the consortium noted is that the process that gives you heads and beds or hospital census of how many, how many people are here, if you pretend this dotted line with the, uh, the cross in it is a hospital, how many people end up there or are observed there at any point in time is a product of admission to the hospital and leaving the hospital through either recovery or death. And that's actually kind of a complicated process that intersects with um, hospital policies about how long people stay and uh, hospital capacities. And so to relax 
or do not require a really detailed understanding of what's happening in hospitals for who they choose to admit, who they choose to discharge, um, sorry, who they, who they choose to keep for a long time versus discharge, we moved toward looking only at admissions data, just the influx in the hospital. So how many new arrivals are there every day? There's, you can think of it also as incident hospitalizations. And this is sometimes called line list data where you would have each line in a data sheet would represent a patient and their date of admission. And this is much harder to get. And so the UT COVID-19 Modeling Consortium has this for the city of Austin only through uh, an agreement with some of the healthcare systems in the city. Uh, there's a push to make these type of data more common. Okay, so we revisit our model life cycle. Um, we're still asking, we're still trying to figure out what is the demand for hospital capacity? Have we flattened the curve? How close are we? How bad will this get? But now our model is more complicated. Uh, we have a slightly different formulation of our SEIR model, of our compartment model that includes mobility data. And uh, it also layers in this partially observed Markov process in a regression framework that allows us to estimate temporally variable transmission probabilities without making assumptions about when there were big changes in transmission probability. And our data uh, are largely the same, except we are switching to use admissions and potentially discharge data rather than just the hospital census data. And I haven't talked a whole lot about implementation, uh, which is part of a part of this life cycle. Um, so I want to take a moment to, to briefly mention it. Um, this model runs as a combination of R and, Py and Python. We use the package POMP for partially observed Markov processes in R, and then Python utilities for processing mobility data and uh, creating the dashboard visualizations. So these are tri trivially parallel simulations and modeling a single locality takes approximately four hours. And this is with minimal optimization at this stage. Uh, four hours is short enough that uh, it runs pretty well. Nobody's inclined to mess with it too much, but there is room for automation and improvement. And we run this on Frontera and also on Stampede 2, which, which is an exceed resource. So when Frontera uh, is unavailable because of large scale runs that are, that are taking up the whole system, we can transition over to Stampede 2. This code is, is pretty portable. And the big summary, the big payoff of iterating through this model lifecycle several times is the creation of these dashboards that I introduced at the beginning of the talk on these healthcare demands in Texas and mortality across the United States. Um, two dashboards you can, you can see if you go to the, uh, the UT COVID website. They have been in production since, gosh, roughly, um, last summer, I believe. I can't recall the exact date. Um, so they, they've been stable and and uh, useful dashboards that are viewed particularly uh, by policymakers in the city of Austin, but also in some other cities in Texas and, and other places across the U.S. as well. And um, having these, these dashboards put together and having this model sort of productionized to the extent that it can be at this stage has allowed the consortium to move beyond flattening the curve. And so I want to take just a, a couple more minutes before um, we break for questions and discussion to talk about some of the things that the consortium is doing um, now that sort of societally we've moved past flattening the curve. Uh, we still need the situational awareness that these models provide, but there are other areas where uh, the consortium can really help to inform. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my cat just jumped up on the desk and is really excited about um, moving beyond flattening the curve. I don't know if you heard her meow into my microphone, uh, but the, the consortium has, has diversified. And so there are also other um, insights that the consortium is providing one of the uh, earliest pivots was looking in the late summer and early fall about the risk of reopening schools. It's been incredibly difficult, I know, for, for parents and educators um, and entire communities to navigate 
whether or not it's safe to open schools and how do we best serve our children when uh, we don't have in-person schooling for them and we don't have all of the resources that in-person schooling provides. And so the consortium put together a simple estimator for predicting given underlying COVID prevalence in a county and uh, a pod or school size that you're comfortable with, how many cases would you expect to be introduced in a school or a pod of that size? And so this screenshot of the dashboard is set to a school or a pod size of 100. And you can then see the color map shows you from uh, sort of cream colored to uh, dark red, how many cases you might expect in that population of 100 if you, uh, if you opened up schools, if you had school in session that day. And that can help people understand their local risk and evaluate uh, in-person versus remote learning for their children. There's also uh, a variant detection dashboard. One of the uh, big concerns that I, I know is on everyone's radar is whether these new variants that are circulating that have um, evolved over the course of the pandemic will be vaccine escape variants, whether they will be more transmissible, whether they will produce more severe disease or higher mortality. And we have the technology as a society to do a really rigorous genomic surveillance and sequencing of positive cases. And so using some uh, statistical models, the consortium uh, has put together some visualizations to help policymakers and um, healthcare agencies, uh, hospitals decide how many of their COVID positive specimens they should sequence when new variants are rare in communities, but they would like to detect them. So how many samples do you need to detect uh, a COVID variant when the variant is one out of 1000 cases uh, in your population uh, and you would like to be 99% confident. So this, this green line, you would need to test over 4,500 samples to be able to detect that one in 1,000 um, variant prevalence. And so these sorts of simple visualizations can help policymakers uh, conceptualize the level of surveillance they need to perform. There's also investigation in uh, heterogeneous vulnerability and burden, um, looking at social vulnerability index, which is a, a data metric that's produced by the CDC that represents um, resilience to disaster or vulnerability to disaster. Uh, and the consortium has done some nice work showing that uh, populations that are more vulnerable, and this is a, a percentile rank going from zero to 0 0.8, um, as communities, as you look at communities that are more vulnerable, they do uh, bear a higher percentage of the infections and uh, they tend to see lower reporting. So we are generally, and this map here is, is Austin, Texas. UT is, is right around here. TAC is up in North Austin, right, right around there. Uh, and the shading here is showing vulnerability across zip codes in the Austin metro area. And so we know that we are not serving all of the populations within our community equally. And this has consequences for uh, resource distribution and, um, and vulnerabilities. So um, I, will, I will end on this slide. I have a couple more slides after this. Uh, however, uh, in the interest of saving some time for questions, um, I just wanna end on uh, the next thing that we're working on, which is trying to take these models and turn them into high resolution neighborhood level models by uh, connecting different instances of these compartmental models by for, so like one for each neighborhood in a meta population model and allowing travel between the neighborhoods so that we have a more nuanced conceptualization of transmission that is hyper-local and allows us to evaluate resource demands, be they hospitalization or vaccination or um, antiviral drugs, should they become available, that allows us to, to evaluate uh, those resources 
very locally and hopefully make some, some positive impacts in the Austin community and uh, scale that out to other communities as, uh, as they may need. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up through the very last couple of slides and um, just highlight again, if you are interested in looking at the dashboards and reading the publications, uh, covid19.tac.utexas.edu has all of that information. And if you have any questions that we don't have a chance to get to in the next five minutes or so, uh, you are welcome to send me an email, uh, kpierce at tac.utexas.edu. So thank you all for, uh, for listening. And there are a couple of questions in the chat. So I'm just going to, I'm going to dive right into them. Um, Kenneth asks, how much did each of the individual changes to the model contribute to the improvement in the confidence intervals? So oh, let's go back to this slide. Um, so we are, again, looking at some of these, these early projections. We have not done the rigorous post hoc validation that would answer your question directly, Kenneth. Um, we have done essentially a bunch of rapid fire changes trying to narrow the confidence intervals, but we haven't, we haven't actually asked how much did any given change reduce the variance in, um, in the projections. That is, we're I think long overdue for a retrospective on how, how we've handled this. And that's absolutely something that we, we want to address when we do that. So not, not a satisfying or direct answer to your question, but um, modeling and communicating uncertainty is, is really critical. And, um, and it's a good point that we can, we can dig into that a little bit more. Um, Jim comments that sewer surveillance experiments might help uh, where you can test many individuals at a time. So that's, that's a really great point. Um, it is something a lot of places are doing. Um, there is um, one of the civil engineers at UT, uh, Mary Jo Kurtzitz, is uh, leading what the university is calling Project Canary, which is also doing wastewater surveillance. And she's done some nice work showing how, um, how there are, how you can detect a lot of, a lot of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater near, um, near areas where people are quarantining and also where um, when the outbreak is is really peaking because now we've had we've had two two distinct waves move through Austin and so there's a lot of data uh, there so yeah sewer surveillance experiments uh, will will definitely help with early detection which is something that waiting for hospitalizations or waiting for test positivity won't get us Great, great comment. Great, Dan, thank you, Kelly. Do we have any any last questions? Um, oh, uh, just another comment that um, that sewer wastewater surveillance might be useful for variant detections. Um, yeah, that's um, that's something I know the UT team is looking into uh, sequencing some of their samples as well. So. Um, I, and I just want to close uh, by really highlighting, you know, this is the ECSS symposium. Uh, it's people who are interested in high performance computing. And this talk has been very uh, high performance computing agnostic. Uh, but that is, it's due to the problem at hand. And we have been setting the stage for, for scaling up this work uh, to really uh, leverage the full capabilities of these systems and uh, having the expertise even if not needing you know, the entirety of Stampede 2, having the expertise of the TAC team to help the modelers put these codes together and, and get them running has been, has been really instrumental. And we're super excited about the, um, the more uh, HPC heavy applications of these models as we scale them to larger areas with, uh, with, with more and more hospitalization data that we're getting. Great, thank you, Kelly. 
Um, fa fantastic presentation. Re really enjoyed it. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We are at the top of the hour, so we should wrap things up. I see folks are already dropping off because they probably have maybe beginning at the top of the hour. Again, thank you very much. And Kelly, I'll follow up with you about getting a slide so that we can put them on the ECSS Symposium page along with your recording. Great.